Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please go to the LinkedIn Live video feed, the link to which I've just placed in the chat room. This show thrives on participant contributions, and all participants are encouraged to actively participate by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please either write in the chat room or turn on your microphone and say hi. We'll be delighted to hear from you. Tonight, our featured guest is Sullivan Fortner, a jazz pianist. His latest album, Solo Game, will be the subject of tonight's conversation. Welcome, Sullivan. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Thanks, Sullivan. Simon, for having me, man. My pleasure. So, Sullivan, tell us a little bit about where you come from, how your musical tastes were formed, and why you decided to become a jazz pianist. Should I just call you Simon? Is it Simeon or Simon? Both are just fine. Simeon's fine. Nah. Oh, there it is. Okay, because it looks like Simeon on here. So I'm sorry. <laughs> um. I'm doing fine. Uh, thank you. So I was born in um, New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I come from a family of singers, not really a lot of musicians. Um, and um, I grew up playing in church. That was like my, my upbringing. I started playing in church when I was about seven years old, um, playing for the choirs, all the choirs. From the male chorus to the 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 old the the adult sanctuary choir, and uh, that was about seven years old. And from then, um, I you know became enamored by this guy who came to the church and and played organ and they playing all kinds of stuff on the organ I'd never heard before. He would give me a demonstration. It's like okay, that's classical, and then he was like, listen to this, and he play something else. It's like oh, that's jazz, and I was like, wow. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to play like that. So I applied to uh, New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, Performing Arts High School. And there I got exposed to, you know, started taking piano lessons officially. Before then, it was all ear training. It was all caught by ear. And um, yeah, started classical lessons and started jazz lessons. And for some reason, because of my church upbringing, I guess I took more to the jazz aesthetic of things. So that's how I became a jazz pianist. And uh, they've been playing ever since I was about 13 or 14 playing jazz. And I'm 37 now. Wow. Okay. Let's listen to the next, uh, the next track. This is called It's a Game. Thank you. 
So Sullivan, tell us about this new album. We just played, we heard one track from side A, which is extremely, how do I say, uh, classic, uh, conservative, piano being played, you know, as it as we think of it. And this one, ex side B, extremely experimental. <clears throat> tell us about this album, Solo Game. Um, Solo Game was sort of a COVID-19 project. Um, the first thing, uh, basically it was birthed out of frustration. Um, I had a, I was during COVID, I was in like a slew of like a bunch of recordings with a bunch of different artists. I recorded with, uh, Cecile McLaurin Salvant. I did a recording with, uh, quite a few recordings actually with her. I did a recording with Peter Bernstein. I did a recording with, uh, Mike Moreno and a, a bunch of, just, just a bunch of, jazz musicians during that time and i i was frustrated because i hadn't really recorded anything for, excuse me since 2017 and one day i just expressed that to my girlfriend and i was just like look i'm, I'm like burnt out i haven't really been in a studio recording and i feel frustrated that i don't have anything and i don't i'm not inspired to do anything and she said just go in the studio you have some money because i won this grant that uh, that gave me money to basically basically supplemented that entire time when we were kind of shut down and she was like you have money go in the studio lock yourself in there for four days and just see what happens so the result of it was actually the game part and that was Everything on that album, for the most part, with the exception of maybe one and two, were completely improvised compositions that were spliced and edited and then listened to and then I formatted it and connected it so it would sound like one song. And then I did a lot of stacking. So I did, I'm playing like synth, I'm playing bass, I'm playing drums, I'm playing celeste, playing... Every instrument that you hear on that side is me, except for a little bit of the vocal, which was done by Cecile, and some of the hand clapping. <laughs> um, and then out of frustration of shopping that side of the album around and not being picked up by any label, like there was no jazz label nowhere that wanted the album. Um, I got the bright idea and said, well, maybe that won't work. Maybe I should do an acoustic piano album. So I called Fred Hirsch and Fred Hirsch called James Farber and we nailed out a time uh, in June of 2022. And we just did everything in one take. We were in and out the studio in about four or five hours. Um, and the result was about 30 songs. And we picked nine of them. And I said, okay, cool. They were like, put that. I bet your jazz music, I bet your jazz labels would pick this up. But then I thought about it because the pandemic, every piano player was putting out solo piano albums. I mean, you go down the list. Brad Meldow, Fred Hirsch, uh, VJ Iyer, Jason Moran, just, uh, Kenny Barron, every jazz pianist put out a, a solo piano album during the pandemic so i had the bright idea and cecile also she was like let's why don't you just put the two albums together <laughs> and that's how solo game came about and that was it wow and uh so do you see it that way then is it it's kind of a side a traditional and then what you do very well everybody knows that you do very well and then the second side is kind of you don't know what's happening. It's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a, uh, we don't know yet. I, I think on, I think on the surface, it could appear that way, but both albums really complement each other because they both kind of describe in multiple ways how I create music. Um, one of the things that I talk about with, with students that I have, the few students that I actually have that actually stick with me, <laughs> is that, you know, I try to not look at the piano as 
a piano. I try to reimagine the instrument in my mind as I'm playing it. So basically, side A is side B reduced to a piano. So when I'm playing piano, what I'm hearing in my head is all of the instruments on side B. And I'm just translating it to the piano in real time and vice versa, if that makes sense. So I'm not necessarily hearing a piano when I play. I hear trumpets, I hear organs, I hear singers, I hear drums. I mean, well, don't you worry about the thing in the beginning, I was just totally trying to be a percussion session. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, you know, that's, that's just what I'm hearing in my head and I just try to translate it as best as I could to the, the limitations of the instrument. Okay. that I have. And then the other side of it is like, okay, these are, in, these are the instruments that I'm hearing in my head that I don't have any type of technical facility on at all. So I have to, so the name of that game is basically relying on my musical instincts to make music, which is very, very similar to how I play piano. It's all about instinctual, reactive, a little bit of I don't know what I'm doing on both ends because I don't have, you know, I have a sketch and a game plan in my head, but I don't really know what's going to happen, you know, while I'm playing or as I'm playing. So, yeah, they, they both really complement each other. Let's have a listen. This is I'm All Smiles. So Sullivan, now um, up to now, I've had featured guests on Vienna Live and they've always brought albums that uh, really present a, a team of musicians. This is the first time that um, I've had someone with a solo album. Tell us what solo performance means to you and what ensemble performance means. You were just saying that... Uh, you know, you are being a one person percussion section and all that. You're just letting your music fantasy go. Where does that, what does that have to do also with performing with other people? How do you see all of that? What's that mean? Um, well, when I, when I play with other people, of course, a lot of those sounds are not necessarily in my head, but a lot of the same principles um, still exist. So like for instance, if I'm playing with a bass player or a drummer, those 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 things I don't necessarily hear in my head, <laughs> so to speak. Um but I do as far as the principles go, I mean I'm still hearing other instruments and not just the instruments themselves, the articulations of the instruments, the dynamics of the instruments, the capabilities of the of the instruments and the phrasing. Um, 
So it's almost like I'm creating limits to myself on a on a limitless instrument. And the more instruments that are involved, the more limitations I have. I don't know if that makes sense. It, it does. Tell us about um, then about personalities, because, uh, of course, that's such an important part, right, that performing with, uh, I mean, most of the people I've had on, they've been performing with people who are their friends, people they get along with. What? Is, what? Is, tell us about the human aspect there. You're talking about very abstract rhythm, tone, what you hear, but there's so much more, right, to music than that. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of a lot of music, again, is it, it's reactive. You know, you're playing with with different. If you're playing in an ensemble or you're playing in a trio setting, you're dealing with three distinct personalities, and you're dealing with compromise. You know, um, when you're playing by yourself, the only person you're really compromising with is yourself. <laughs> so you're kind of left up to your own devices. You're left to your own limitations. You know, you're left to your own, and it's it, and playing by yourself is very very exposing. And in some aspects, it could be really, really good. It could be really revealing. It could be very freeing because you don't, then you don't have to worry about, you know, you can change key anytime you want to change key. You can change the feel anytime you want to change the feel. You can, um, you know, you can change the, change the song anytime you want to change the song. But when you're playing with more than one person, you're playing with two, two or more people, then you have to consult with a board, so to speak. <laughs> you know, you got to kind of come together and kind of agree. And sometimes you agree to disagree. You know, sometimes you have to kind of put whatever your own ego is or whatever it is that you want to do to the side for the sake of the, for the sake of everyone else. You know, I always equate it to like, being in a relationship with somebody, you know, it's like, okay, well, I want, this is what I want to eat, but this person might be allergic to that. So what can I do? <laughs> what can we do so that I can be able to cook for the whole house and everybody can enjoy it? You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying? And it may not necessarily be what I want, but it will be probably in the end, of the, the, the end result will be just as good and everybody will be fed and it'll be cool. Okay, let's have another listen. This is again, this is the B side, and this is Snakes and Ladders. Okay, so Sullivan, now we come to the uh, more uh, philosophical part of the conversation, and I have written the question here, Sullivan, quote, February is Black History Month in the United States, and the cultural institutions of the federal government join in paying tribute to the generations of African Americans who struggled with adversity to achieve full citizenship in American society, end quote. As the ethnomusicologist Julio Mendeville has explained on this program, music is a uniquely powerful means to unite people and an equally powerful means to divide people. For example, the classical music crowd wears white collared shirts and their silence means that they're listening. The rap music crowd does things a little bit differently. But a central commonality between the two crowds is that they don't mix well. On the other hand, music unites people like nothing else Think about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Through music, 
the other becomes our brother. I had Beethoven's message in mind when I first opened an African Episcopal Methodist church hymnal at a church service in the south side of Chicago. By chance, on the page I opened to, there was a short introductory paragraph stating that all Americans, each of them toe-tapping to the music of Tina Turner, Whitney Houston, and Michael Jackson, had to admit that, rather than quote-unquote African-American music, it should be considered quote-unquote American music. What are your thoughts on all of this? What makes up Sullivan Fortner Jr.'s music? And is Black History Month simply American History Month? Um, I think that you're muted. Uh... Oh, there he is. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, Lord. Hold on. What's the, that's somebody knocking on my door. Could you come back later? Oh, gosh. Okay. Give me one second. Take your time. So we're going to listen again to another track. This is Come Sunday. Okay. Lovely. You're back with us? Uh, I'm back. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess the subject of Black History Month, I've always had mixed feelings about it. Because while I do think that that it should be it should not be called Black History Month. It should be called American History, and it should be it. You know, and Black music should not be called Black music. It should be called American music. While I do think that that's the, that in some cases should be true, unfortunately, there's been this very very strange dance that America has had with with people of of a minority race especially African-American, given, you know, the, the past 500 years of this <laughs> of history that we have and that we're still enduring to a certain degree. Um, and I think the awareness of the African-American contribution, not just to, not just to music, but to America in general, has been glossed over for such a very, very long time. Um, 
I guess it's important for us to take this time to really uh, celebrate and reflect on not just the people that made America what it is, you know, not and and, and, and you know, the African American past, but also the American African American present and future. Um, I think that um, music, the music, um, the music fact is very, very, very tricky because again, it's a very music is art is a direct reflection of society. So there is always going to be this very, very strange dance between, you know, what is considered quote unquote black music versus non-black music. Um, going back to your statement about rap and classical music, not really the audience is not getting along. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that statement because I mean, most of the hip hop most of the hip hop artists sample classical music all the time. You know what I mean? If if there's any difference, it's the way it's it's in the response. I would say, not necessarily in their liking or disliking of the music or them wanting to get dressed up or whatever. I think it's more or less how they how they choose to respond, and the the how how welcome they feel to respond in that way, that so to speak. Um, coming from, you know, where I come from in the black, I mean, in the a, in a Baptist church and in New Orleans and all that stuff, we believe in dancing. We believe in hollering and screaming. If we love something, we believe in like really, we believe in expressing to the max degree where in some instances in other settings, it can be a little bit more reserved. And um, and unfortunately, in a lot of cases, jazz has become that way. I remember going to Haiti once, and there's somebody that said, "Oh, I don't like jazz." I said, "What do you mean you don't like jazz?" I said, "Jazz is meant for people who have shoes." And that really, at first, I got that reaction, but then I thought about it, and it was like, you know what? The only people who really listen to jazz and understand are the people who can afford to. The people who are, you know, the people who have the, 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 the background of the, you know, the, the, the capabilities, so to speak, to be able to understand it. And that completely was a protest. That was the reason why jazz was formed out of rebellion of that. You know what I'm saying? So um, I think my music and how solo game and how any music that I, I, I've made before and want to make it's to bring a certain type of awareness to that, you know, to not just the African American experience and paying tribute to the great masters that have also done that. But I believe that music is music. There's only two different types of music. And I believe that, you know, it is important for all of us to embrace and to hold on the same level as we would hold a Bach or Beethoven who was a Moor or, or, uh, um, or Mozart or whatever. I mean, or, you know, Schumann, you know, to hold, the, hold Duke Ellington on that same level, to hold Charlie Park on that same plane, to hold uh, Aretha Franklin on that same plane is like a Maria Kala, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's, you know, and until we're, until we can do that, <laughs> You know, until we can actually do that, then there'll always be that divide. I don't know if, I, if that answers your question, but. Very, 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 very well. Um, and mm -hmm. Sullivan, just for the young person, the young Sullivan Fortner uh, Jr., who met the uh, that man at the church who said, this is classical music and this is jazz and all that. What do you, what do you tell the other young people? As you said, it's, it's about, it's a privilege getting to have new knowledge and the hip hop artists, when they get to a certain level, they're sampling classical music, classical music sampling hip hop, but only once you have a certain, uh, how do I say, a uh, uh, privilege of, of knowledge. Tell So what do you say to the, to the young people? 
I would say to the young people that there's not so much a divide as far as the privilege of, of gaining that knowledge because, I mean, we could, everything has been reduced to the palm of our hands. You know, I mean, we can, we can access any type of music from anywhere in the world at any point, any time on Spotify, on YouTube or whatever. The, the, the deal is, is just to have the openness and the willingness to, you know, to maybe step out there and learn a different language and look wrong and look stupid for a second. <laughs> you know, not having so much ego, not having too much ego to try something new and to experience something new and to listen to something and, and explore because that's what, that's what art is all about. Okay, let's listen to one last song. This is from the B-side and it is called Spacewalk. Okay. Last question then, Sullivan. What do you wish those who listen to this album? Um, I wish for people, I think the overarching theme of the, of this album is that as musicians and, and as uh, artists, sometimes we forget the idea of innocence and we forget the idea of play. Uh, we play music we don't work music <laughs> so to speak um so i think what i want people to remember is to never ever lose the essence of play and fun because that's i mean and, and it's so easy to be distracted with all of the work that we have to do <laughs> all the time and the stress that that entails and to not forget about the other side that that, that thing that gives you joy, that thing that causes you to not just work and to think, but also allows you to play and have fun and discover and try and, and do new things and step outside of your comfort zone. Um, that's the general overarching theme of the album. And I hope that people, will, it, they will challenge people to explore more that innocent playful side. Okay, let's see how we can buy the album. It's easy enough. You go to SullivanFortnerMusic.com. And let's see, I think we have here right now, we've got the tour date. So if anyone's uh, we've got upcoming concerts, well, today, there it is in Orlando, Florida, then tomorrow in Napa, California. So we've got the whole schedule right here, packed schedule. 
as we can see. Uh, so um, come to SullivanFortnerMusic.com and you'll get these tour dates. And then we also have the contact here. If you need to get, if you'd like to reach out, can people reach out to you with their questions, Sullivan? Oh, yeah, please do. Um, actually, this is my agent's contact information. Uh, my contact information is SullivanFortner at gmail.com. Perfect. Very easy. SullivanFortner yep. at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out to Sullivan with your questions and your comments. And then about buying the uh, buying the album, Sullivan, is there some uh, some place particular? We um, that I don't think. Yeah, just go Amazon, mm -hmm. Amazon, or CD Baby, or uh, any of your streaming outlets. They should have it for sure. There it is. Okay, Solo perfect. Game. So, yeah, there's Sullivan's uh, album, and there's another of his albums. So, uh, that's feel... the very first album I did. Yep, fantastic. Yep. So, um, feel free again to reach out to Sullivan with your questions or comments by the album. Uh, and Sullivan, look forward to hearing from you. And we thank you, Sullivan Fortner Jr., so much for joining us and sharing your 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 wisdom and talents with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So let's take a look at what's coming up next week on Vienna Live. Actually, it's in two weeks that it will be coming up. And it is Yuri Ulrich's Sex in the World. What is comprehensive sexuality education and why is it important to teach children from a young age? Oh, yeah. And can you even teach sex in, say, Indonesia? After all, understandings of sex in Indonesia must be a bit different than sex in the Netherlands. Yuri Ulrichs, a world-renowned sex educator at Rutgers, the world's premier sex think tank, joins us to discuss the importance of comprehensive sexuality education in the West and in the rest. Come welcome Yuri to Vienna Live. And that is on Wednesday, March 6th. So Wednesday in two weeks. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www. Uh, www.simeonmorrow.com once again thank you so very much to Sullivan Fortner Jr. thank you to Victoria and Frederick Mulligan and Agnieszka and Benoit Rivole for their support of this show thanks also to my cousin Mike a marketer at Layer App they, if you're an engineer or an architect they've got a really cool tool you should check out also thank you to Mary Schlesinger for the lovely Viennese library you can see behind me most of all thanks to you our participants who make it all worthwhile from New London, New Hampshire, New York City, New York and New Orleans, Louisiana. Goodbye, and see you Wednesday in two weeks. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Simeon.